So good morning. Thank you for having me. Thank you to the minister for introducing me. And thank you for bringing us all together to talk about this very important topic, the design of online and blended learning environments for students with disabilities. This year has been a difficult year for all of us. We have many lessons learned. And I think what we're gonna talk about over the next few minutes here is hopefully gonna help you as you think about the future of designing learning environments really for all students, but specifically for students with disabilities. Let me tell you a little bit about my work. So as was introduced and is in my bio, it covers a number of areas. My work is really kind of generally focused on designing learning environments for all students, but specifically students with disabilities. And I don't only look at the environment from a physical environment, a digital environment, but I look at the intersection of those two things. And how do we design environments that really meet those needs? A lot of the framework that I use is universal design for learning. And so I have this wonderful job where I used to be able to fly around the globe and really kind of focus on designing and working with uh, schools and ministries of education uh, as they thought about the future of education. Uh, and I did that through the different intersections of what I do at the University of Kansas and at CAST, the founders of UDL, and a nonprofit that I had started, the UDL Implementation and Research Network. But recently, uh, we had a national center here in the United States. And I was one of the co-leaders of this national center. We had the Center of on Online Learning and Students with Disabilities. And this center ran from 2011 to 2016 and actually kind of continues on today in, in various facets. But we were a national research center that really began looking at online learning for students with disabilities because we saw a growing trend across the United States in not only the development of fully virtual environments, but also blended and even personalized environments. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of our findings and how those play a role in what you're about to undertake or what you're doing in your classrooms here today um, and uh, how it's gonna impact the future of education as a whole. Also, we just recently had funded the Center for Innovation, Design and Digital Learning. And you guys are the first people to actually hear about this beyond uh, our small team. We just received this national uh, center to support uh, and improve faculty capacity to use educational technology. So our national center is gonna be providing technical assistance throughout the United States, and actually it's gonna be freely available beyond to support and improve faculty capacity, higher education faculty capacity to use educational technology as they support personnel development for students with disabilities. And this is a very, very important center because what it's gonna do, it's going to pick up where our Center of Online Learning left off, which is that we need to have faculty members that know how to educate those uh, students in more innovative environments. And we also need individuals to leave our higher education settings knowing how to teach in those environments. So we're very excited about this opportunity. So this year has just been an extraordinary year in many different ways. Uh, we, with COVID and the impact of COVID and what it has done to our classrooms and the way we design learning environments for students with disabilities to actually impacting directly to the families and us finding out that there's a number of things going on in the environments uh, that we design for, that we take for granted. Uh, we take for granted students show up every day and they uh, have the appropriate tools for learning. But what we've known for a long time is that's not necessarily true. That when we think about the environment very specifically, we understand, we understand that what we do as the designers of the learning environment, whether it be a face-to-face -face environment, whether it be a blended environment, or whether it even is a fully virtualized environment, what we do and how we design those environments directly impacts the outcomes those environments are going to have. But let me not get ahead of myself. Let me back up and think about and, and share with you some of the historical sort of understandings that we came away with 
when we ran the National Research Center on online learning. So let me give you some basic sort of definitions. There are various types of online settings. There are fully virtual or online learning is what we know it today. Many universities throughout the globe have been investing in this for over the last 20 years in developing online programs. What is unknown to many is that throughout many countries, online fully virtual settings have been also very active in K-12. Um, and so a fully virtual setting, I think we all know what that is now, or fully online setting. I think if I was introducing this slide about a year ago, many would say, I don't quite understand what that is. But what we have to know is that millions of students just in the United States prior to the pandemic were opening up their laptops and attending school through their laptop. And, and the United States is not the only country where this was taking place. Then we have blended online environments. And those are the environments that you're working in now, where we have a blend of the use of digital technology with face-to-face, -face, with the normal face-to-face -face sort of practices, and blend those together in a merger to design and focus on supporting the students in that environment through those various mechanisms. Within the blended environment, there are varying ways in which you can do that, right? So within that environment, students have some element of control over the time, place, or pace in which they are supervised. And we're going to talk more about that, especially when we talk about more learner-centered or personalized environments. And then there's a supplemental online, and we're not going to talk much about that today, but supplemental online environments are when a student might take a course uh, that's not available at their home school in just an online setting. So it might be even a high school student, which we have in the United States now. In fact, my daughter, who's a, who's a, a third year in, in her high school out of junior, is in an online setting now, taking college classes already, working towards getting college credit while still in high school. It's a supplemental online class. What are some of the findings? What's, what do we know? So I'm just going to focus on the United States because that's where I've focused on most of our research. So what you have to realize is that by 2012, all 50 states in the United States and five of our territories had fully virtual, fully online schools. That by 2016, every single school district across the United States reported some form of blended learning. They reported some form of blended learning. That our national law that oversees students with disabilities, we call it IDEA, Individuals Disabilities Education Act, IDEA, had some mandated, mandated, that students with disabilities, or SWD as I'm going to refer to them, uh, had equal opportunity to participate in these fully online schools, in these fully online schools. Thus, by 2016, the enrollment of students with disabilities in, our, in fully online schools, fully online schools, by choice, by parent choice, uh, varied from 2.5 to 3 million. Now, we all know what happened last spring across the globe. 1.5 billion students, 1.5 billion students had their school year interrupted by the pandemic. And that interruption either caused them to go into fully online or to actually even move into some sort of no school or remote school setting. In the United States, it impacted over 55 million students. That meant over 20 million students with disabilities were uh, put into online settings nearly overnight. And you can imagine this tax the system well beyond, well beyond its capacity. Part of that taxing of the system was that what we found in 2016 was that still in 2016, there was a general lack of clear guidance or even research for how to support students with disabilities in online settings. There is a huge need, not only in the United States, but beyond for thinking about what clear guidance should be and how to support students in these online settings. 
Let me just show you a little bit more specifically what I'm talking about. Within the United States, and in many countries around the world, students with disabilities are to be provided with some form of free and appropriate public education, or what we call FAPE. FAPE is the responsibility of the local school district to design and support these students in these settings. What online school has provided is a means by which a student can live in one area and technically be attending school in another area. So as of 2016, our research found that 37, 37 states and territories, or 67% of the states and territories did not have clear guidance on who was even responsible for providing faith. Absolutely amazing. But we also found a lot of challenges. We also found a lot of challenges as we thought about and, and conducted research in online and blended settings. And we can go into days of conversation about what our findings were, but I know I only have a few minutes here today, so I quickly wanted to go over some for you. What we found in multiple studies were that, was that teachers were not prepared to teach in online and blended settings. Over and over again, especially special education teachers, were not prepared to teach in online and blended settings. And it moves well beyond their technological skill. It goes into things around their capacity to understand how to even design environments from the very beginning. We also found that technology as a whole, the instructional technologies of today, are not actually designed to support students with disabilities. There are many issues around still accessibility from the very basic sort of understanding of accessibility all the way through what it means to, de to design and support effective instruction in those environments. And what's really alarming and kind of unknown to most is that digital learning as a whole, as you support digital learning in these environments, it's very much different as compared to face-to-face. -to -face. Case in point, there's been a tremendous amount of research that has supported the notion that just reading a book in a physical form or doing conducting reading in a physical form versus reading in a digital form has vast differences around things like comprehension. And so what we have to realize is that we can't just take our normal day-to-day -day sort of operations in a face-to-face -face environment and then transplant them into a digital environment that we really have to think carefully around what that means. And it can be simple things, like simply teaching students how to operate things like videos. Like, what do you do when you get lost? You pause, you stop, you rewind. Things like this sound simple, but unless they're explicitly taught, many students don't understand how to even approach those learnings. There's no such thing as digital natives. These things, these individuals do not exist. We still have to instruct these students, all students, but specifically students with disabilities on how to effectively work in these environments. And that relies on educators being able to do that and change their practices. But here's, this, here's the exciting thing. These environments also offered a bunch of opportunity and they offer a number of affordances that are not provided in just general face-to-face -face sort of settings. The picture here that you're seeing on the screen is in a school district in an urban area of the United States that undertook a mission to transform its environment to be blended so that each one of the students had a personalized learning plan. Now, some of the students also had an individualized learning plan those students with disabilities, but all students had a personalized learning plan. And they use varying forms of data and various practices to help personalize that experience for each one of the students in a competency-based format. But let me talk to you about some affordances. So we can provide greater access to content in these online environments and really raise the bar for what's even possible 
for students with disabilities as opposed to what was going on in face-to-face -face environments. We can open up new horizons for supporting multiple means of representation, multiple means of engagement, and multiple means of action and expression and what can be done in these environments. There are ongoing and findings that support, as I said earlier, greater affordances in personalized environments. These personalized environments are really designed for really breaking down and supporting the individual needs of all the students. Our research has shown very early on that students in these personalized environments sometimes made multiple year growth gains in one year period. In fact, most of the students made over one year's gain in growth over a one year period in these personalized environments. And that includes students with disabilities. In fact, many students with disabilities made more than one year's growth gain in these personalized environments. We just recently published a, a pretty extensive literature review that actually talks about this in more detail, and that really looks at 71 other studies that have shown positive growth, positive outcomes in all students. Uh, across academic, social, emotional, and even executive function development using personalized learning. So I, I'm kind of excited about this. I think this is something that as we think about the future and how to design environments, it should be a very, it should play a key role in thinking about how we design and support more learner-centered or personalized environments. Now, let's talk to you about some considerations. I know many people are here like, okay, great. I understand there's differences. I understand what the research says, but what are some things we should be thinking about? So let's think about designing from the old to the new. And what does that actually mean? Well, let's think about considerations in research. If you're a researcher out there and you're watching this today and you're an educational researcher, the first thing I would do is think about how to develop more interdisciplinary research, how to support that. If you're a, uh, someone that is in charge of policy and can work in this area, I would think about how do I fund more interdisciplinary research? Interdisciplinary research is at, the, is at the forefront of what we should be doing. In fact, beneath you there in the image that you're seeing, it's showing some of the work that we've been doing as we work with not only uh, across the learning sciences, but in working with uh, people in computer science and programming around designing uh, digital tools that can support students with disabilities. In fact, one of the projects that I, I have and my colleague, uh, Jose Blackerby at CAST, is a tool called Corgi. And Corgi is, we call it Corgi because it's about co-organizing co your learning. We also just like the Corgi dog. We think it's cute, right? But what Corgi supports is it supports students with disabilities in higher order thinking in areas of STEM education. And we have a tremendous amount of research and our, some of the initial studies that have supported this tool and being developed. And we were recently refunded, refunded by the US Department of Education to do further research and scale the development of this tool to even be better. And you can learn more about it if you go to corgi.cast.org. You can learn more about it. But we also, as researchers, need to balance our basic discovery research with applied research. We need to have a firmer understanding of what's the difference in these environments that are digital as opposed to those that are face-to-face. Uh, -face. We have to develop new systems for supporting and mastering learning and figuring out how to measure learning in these new environments because research has shown over and over again that these paper-based assessments aren't actually providing us the needed data nor are they actually allowing students especially those students with disabilities to demonstrate actually what they know and we need better and more participatory models that leverage educators students and even parents as researchers in thinking about what that can mean now, let's talk about personnel preparation. What are some considerations for personnel preparation? Well, personnel preparation has to focus on both university faculty and educators themselves, both in pre-service educators as well as in in-service educators. And it's more than just technology use. 
teaching teaching tools to educators, okay, that's important. But if it's out of context, it's not going to make a difference. We have to consider the roles in things like competency-based micro-credentials, of which I'm showing one down at the bottom there on learningdesigned.org, which is run as a nonprofit entity to support teachers in understanding things like UDL and has micro-credentials associated with it. We need to focus on developing these learner-centered educators so that educators actually understand what that means, that they could be really the designers of the environment in learning designers, that we support and start with a foundational understanding of universal design for learning, and then we develop new models of implementation that involve these blended settings. Now let's talk about policy and practice. Overall, there should be a commitment to learner-centered education and designing more learner-centered environments that begin with UDL. We need to identify those practices and tools that support both face-to-face -face and digital environments. We should be testing these tools and working with these tools, but when we take on the adoption of new tools in our schools, we need to think about how are all students going to use these from the very beginning and what happens if we end up in a fully virtual or online setting? Or what happens if we need this to be blended in a blended setting? What does it actually mean and how might it be utilized? And we have to push tool developers as policymakers and as education leaders to support the design of these tools. And we have to ensure they're accessible. Now, we have to bring parents and learners to the table and have a conversation with them about what's working and what's not. We have to develop a partnership in education that includes the learners themselves and the parents. As we found out during the pandemic and as people went into fully virtual or online settings, parents play a critical role in the learning process. And, and we need to bring them to the table as partners to think about how to best support that going forward. Finally, we have to think about the fourth industrial revolution and how this more connected and global society will reshape disability and special education. What you have to know is the pandemic was probably only a warning sign of things to come. It's not going to be the last global issue we're dealing with in education, and it's going to be reshaping our society as a whole. But I don't want to leave here today by, without talking about what can be just done tomorrow. What can you do tomorrow as you show up into your classroom be it in higher education or even in, or in, in a K-12 setting, blended, fully online, face-to-face, -face, wherever you're at in practice. Quickly, what can you do? The first thing you have to do is ask, who's being left out? So one of the things you can do is ask, who's being left out? And then ask why. Make some observations about why people are being left out. What are the barriers associated with who's being left out? I want you to think about what your data says. Are you, does your data identify and predict the barriers within the learning environment? Does it embed the multiple voices, including the learners, the parents, and the educators, and helping them support decisions around that? And does it consider the different environments? Are we gathering the appropriate amount of data in both in face-to-face -face and digital environments? And how are we merging those two things together to support learning of all students, but specifically those learners that need extra support, those with disabilities. Another thing you can choose to do is look for barriers. There are multiple barriers in our learning environments, and as soon as you start looking for them, you'll see them. It could be as simple as paper-based work is a struggle for some, and simply moving them to a digital setting might provide more. But there's actually multiple elephants in the room. And you're going to find that out as you start looking for barriers. Finally, what you can do is you can ask, what does your learning environment actually say to your learners? As you approach the learning environment, do your students see it as a sit in desks and rows and look up front and do nothing more? Or are they seeing it as an interactive environment? where they can use various tools and various technologies to engage and support their own learning? Are there things on the walls that support 
the design, that the design of the learning environment is really focused on them. Now, I realize the design of environments overall may look different than this year than other years. But emerging research is coming out to say that as we design more flexible environments where students have more space, is on the slide that's next to me, you're, we're finding that students are more engaged when they get to choose how they sit, where they sit, whatever. But we realize this year is a little bit different. Now, maybe some of you just want to learn more and you want some free resources. You can go to learningdesigned.org. You can go to learningdesigned.org, which, uh, which is a platform run by CAST and the UDL IRN that supports the global adoption and understanding of, of how to design learning environments, specifically with UDL at the center, but also how to undertake the use of tools as we support things like blended learning and executive functioning in those environments and academics in those environments. And there are an absolute ton of resources there that you can use on your own free time and, and kind of learn more for yourself. There's also those micro credentials there that you can learn more about UDL as well as other things. And you can undertake that sort of uh, personalized learning pathway yourself as you think about the future. So I wanna say thank you for having me again. If you want to learn more, I've already said go to learningdesign.org. My contact information is there, and I'm ready to take your questions. Thank you very much.